to speak in English just to introduce uh, our distinguished guest from uh, Technology University of Malaysia. Uh, we met him last year, actually. Uh, he came here uh, to, to, get the, to get the DOST award, uh, which was uh, delivered to uh, Professor Said Nakib El Attas, who is uh, one of the most prominent uh, scholars and well known worldwide. And uh, he came and took the uh, award on behalf of uh, his professor, and uh, he gave um, a very interesting presentation uh, about his studies and uh, related works, and uh, uh, many people asked the presentation after your, uh, after your talk, actually, we delivered it, you know, and I really uh, uh, nearly know that uh, also also, Professor Wan Dawood um, uh, mentioned about the experience in Istanbul, I mean about the Dost Awards and the atmosphere of the people in his university, yes, uh, in a very prestigious uh, conference. Uh, now, uh, thank to him because uh, he didn't omit us during his uh, journey uh, in Istanbul, in Turkey, and we are honored uh, to have him today with this uh, conference, inshallah. Um, I, want to, uh, I want to explain something uh, about him because, uh, as I mentioned, uh, about Seyyid Nakib El Attas, who is a very uh, well-known, prominent uh, scholar uh, worldwide. Um, actually, he he follows the he follows the uh, main issue of his work, and uh, he appointed. I mean, Professor Wan Dawood appointed as the chair professor, uh, which was uh, initiated by the Queen. Yes which was initiated by the Queen in his university. Uh, so now he is the address uh, of this uh, great, uh, uh, great masterpieces. And um, I think, I think um, he will explain, he will explain uh, in uh, brief uh, what he uh, wants to do here, but uh, the main concept uh, actually is based on the model of um, Said Nakib El Attas, uh, which he um, established uh, for the education. It's a kind of model, it's a kind of education model uh, from our understanding based on uh, Sufi uh, temper and based on uh, Sufi tradition. Uh, so uh, it's uh, one of the most important interests for our uh, institute. Uh, now we are waiting for his interesting presentation and it's, uh, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce him and to invite him for his Talk, please. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh, and good afternoon. Uh, Thank you, Professor Elif Erhan, Director of the Center for Sufi Studies. I'm honored to be invited here and to have in front of me good friends, Professor Pasana Chiganj, Professor Niyadi Baki, and Professor Rashad, and now lady professors. When I came here last November, I did emphasize to Hoja Effendi, Yamal Noor, that uh, we should strengthen our 
relationship. When I brought home the kind gifts which uh, Hoja Fendi, uh, Jamal Noor presented to Pranakal Atas, the scroll, and many other kind gifts, he was very thankful and he read the books also. And he approved our intention to cooperate and to strengthen ourselves because there are so many intensive commonalities between our traditions, not only as Muslim, but as scholars of the internal dimension of Islam. Uh, before I talk about education, what I mean by integrated education, let me just share with you what we understand from Prof. Nakal Atas's understanding of Tasawwuf or Sufism. Because a great scholar like uh, Professor Marshall Hoxson in his many important works, particularly the venture of Islam, they try to contrast the Sufis with the Fuqaha in the dualistic sense. The Fuqaha, he called them Shariah minded people. The Sufis, as if they are not Shariah minded people. Yes. But in Prohnakil Atas's early work in the 1970s, on the positive aspect of Tasawwuf, he, I thought, for the first time in modern Muslim thought, defined Tasawwuf by officially uniting Sharia and Sufism. He said that Tasawwuf is a practice of Sharia at the maqam of Ihsan. So with that definition, there shouldn't be any more doubt what this, he and his tradition meant by Tasawwuf in the higher sense. Of course, as we all know, there is Islam, which is the practice of Islam for the generality of the people. Of course, they must believe, they must have knowledge about Islam, and they must practice Sharia. But the Sufis doesn't mean their practice of Sharia at that level only. And also we know that, that after Islam, there is Iman. Of course, Iman and Islam are interrelated. You can have Islam without Iman and vice versa. But the Sufis doesn't even mean Sharia at that level, although they also believe in Allah, in the angels, in the prophet, in the kitab, yeah. and in the, in, the, in the decision of good and bad from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what they meant that the true Sufis the true practitioners of Tasawwuf, when they practice Sharia, it is at the level of godliness in a full sense. They all the time they are aware that whatever they do when they follow the Sharia, it is only for the pleasure of Allah It doesn't matter what people say. Of course, it must be based on belief. But more than that, it's based on the pure awareness that God is ever present in existence. So in that sense, that definition already debunked some attempt by even among, among Muslim scholars that the Sufis are not shari'i, shari'i minded. And the Orientalists seem to be making this division into a formality. That, well, don't worry, the Sufis, they don't care about shari'i. The Fuqa are the ones who care about shari'i. Truly, the Sufis care about the shari'i profoundly, but not at the simple, popular, political level. They care about Sharia most profoundly for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we talk about when we talk about Sufism from his perspective, that's what we must understand. And when we must ask, what is his perspective? Is that perspective of Nakal Atas a personal perspective understood by a scholar who was born in the 1930s and still living now? When Muslim scholars went to visit him, including Prof. Pasalan and lately Prof. Sheikh Hamza Yusuf and others. He told them that if people ask you about me, tell them that, that I come from the tradition of the Ba'alawis, which means that a group of people who derive their heritage from the lineage of Sayyidina Ali and Siti Fatima and from the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. They went to Hadramaut, and from there, they spread to India, to Cambodia, and they were the ones who Islamized the Malay, Indonesian, Filipino, archipelago from the 9th century onward. The Islamization of the Malay world is very interesting. 
Islam went to Iran, to Middle East, to Africa, to Europe, together with a military presence. Although Islamization itself was not through military coercion, but in the Malay world, the arrival of Islam came entirely through scholars, mainly from the Ba'alawi -Ba tradition. And his tariqah of Stuvidum, his tariqah is the Alawiyah tariqah. So in that sense, he would claim, as all people from that Ba'alawi tradition claim, that their tariqah is very authentic in that sense. It comes directly, not only from the epistemological sense of the prophetic lineage, but also from the biological and family sense of the tradition as well. So when they talk about charia, they are not talking only from textbookish dimension, but from a long tradition of practice of the charia at that level. That's why the Islamization of the Malay world by these people was proven to be educational in the larger sense of the word, but also taking into consideration the indigenous element, how they absorbed and assimilated into the local cultures, but yet they were able to transform local culture to fit into the universal perspective of Islam. So Islamization there, as anywhere else in a true sense, operated at two dimensional perspectives. One is universalization, which might bring in the universal uh, to everywhere, but also it involves particularization. It takes the local elements of Islam in Malaysia, Indonesia, the Philippines, Southern Thailand, but make it universal. Those elements that do not contradict the teaching of Islam based on its aqidah, sharia, akhlaq, were Islamized in that sense. Therefore, anybody who came to the Malay world, they accept that part of the Malay culture, from the clothing they wear, the food they eat, and so many other things. So there is the the first element that I want to share with you, that when we talk about the Tasawwuf, or the Sufism of Nakal Atas, we are talking about a very much Sharia-minded kind of Sufism. And not only is it Sharia-minded, but also it is, it is based on historic practice of how the Sharia has been implemented by generations of great scholars. Then you ask me, how is this education that he's talking about is related to the solution to our problem now. Of course, the fact that the world is fragmented needs no more proof. Even yesterday, we were told by all the world media that there were two shootings in America, isn't it? So even in a country that is peaceful, not engaged in any external war, seem to be economically highly developed and technically well equipped, but the fragmentation of the society is in so intense that this year alone it was reported that there were 22 cases of public shooting by people who are apparently quite happy with regard to their economic life, yeah. but maybe internally they are not so happy about that. They can handle differences with regard to the arrival of many people from, from Mexico, from the Arab world, and from, from other places. So the fact that this world is fragmented need not be proven anymore. Therefore, how do we offer solution to this fragmented world? Of course, if the answer is through Tasawuf, but what is Tasawuf? So if Tasawuf is anti-Sharia or not Sharia-minded, Muslims will not accept that as acceptable to them. Even Imam Ghazali attacked that. But we understand Tasawuf as a very much Sharia-minded kind of Islam but not at the level of popular understanding only, not even at the level of belief, although we must believe it, but at the highest possible level, that whatever you do or not do is purely because of your awareness of his presence all the time. Therefore, in that Ba'alawi tradition, one of them is Abu Hafs, Omar, Salama, Al-Haddad, one of those people who was credited to be the first Sufis in Nishapur, Iran. He also belonged to the Ba'alawi community. He was saying that Tasawwuf is nothing but Adab. At every level, 
in every moment, in every state. So to them, tasawuf and adab is one and the same thing, basically. To be a true Sufi, you must be concerned about adab all the time, every moment, every place, and every condition. Of course, we have got to explain what this adab means later on. Yeah. But let me, let, let me go ahead further to bring to you the place of adab in Nakib al framework of education reform to solve the problem of fragmentation in our world. When in 1970s, the Muslim world at that time did not have yet the OIC, they established Islamic Secretariat, which was based in Jeddah. And the first secretary was the former Prime Minister of Malaysia, the first Prime Minister, Abdul Rahman. So Tung Abdul Rahman wrote letters to all the major thinkers and scholars of the Muslim world in those times, including one of them is Nakhil Atas. I got, I got the letter which Nakhil Atas replied to Tengku Abdul Rahman's question, what are the problems facing the Muslim world? Because we were so fragmented from within our own Muslim countries, because there were no IC. But even with OIC, we are still fragmented. Imagine before then. So he said in that letter that the Muslim world was having tremendous problems scientifically, economically, sociologically, religiously. But the most basic problems is the problems of confusion and error in knowledge, not just a problem of ignorance. Because somebody who is ignorant is quite simple to be transformed. You give, you give them education, they will not be ignorant anymore. But if you are confused, then it's harder to be cured or to be treated. So Nakhila Ta saw the problem of the modern Muslim as not purely ignorance in a simple sense, but confused. When, you, when we are confused, we don't know where to put what in which particular place. So he said that where, how this problem of confusion started. It, it, this problem started through the loss of adab in our community, among them, which caused the rise of uh, false leadership in every field, in politics, in education, in sciences, in society, in arts, in entertainment. So his proposal was how do you solve the problem of Confucian era in knowledge? which caused the rise of false leadership, is, try to, is trying to tackle the problem of adab. Once adab has been solved, then the right and proper leaders will be developed in every field. And these leaders later on will set up education system that will be suitable to the right of proper leadership and better community. But what is adab again? In the Muslim world, adab has been reduced in its meaning. In the Malay world, adab is reduced only to good manners. You kiss the elders' hands, for example. Husband, uh, wife does that to the husband, students do that to the teachers. When, when senior people come in, we we'll stand up, which is no doubt is correct, but not comprehensive enough. So Nakia Latas went back to our tradition and tried to decipher what were the basic meanings of adab. There he derived the conclusion that adab is the discipline of the mind, body, and soul, which enables its perceiver to recognize the place of something in our system, which finally makes us recognize the place of Allah in the order of being and existence. So when adab is interpreted like that, that is the, 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 the discipline of the, of, of the mind, the soul and the body, which finally makes us able to see where which things are located, which finally makes us see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That already is a very sophisticated definition of adab, isn't it? Because in the Sufi conception, in the level of Isa just now, that if, if, if tasawuf is a practice of sharia at the mark of Ehsan, that's what Ehsan is. Ehsan is the recognition that Allah sees you every, every state. Is it, how is it different from 
Okay. Of course, oh, the Quran says that, that, that uh, the Prophet, if a person of greatest akhlaq, inna kanala khulqun azim, indeed you are of the most refined akhlaq. To my understanding of Naka Atas interpretation of Adab, Adab is that knowledge we produce action, action which we call akhlaq. Because sometimes good action may not be based on knowledge. Kids, for example, may have demonstrated good akhlaq. But, but adab is akhlaq that is based on right and proper knowledge. Because not everybody who behaves properly may be based on right knowledge. Sometimes they're based on imitation. Sometimes based on habit. So when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that Adabani Rabbi Fa'asana Ta'adibi that is a statement of fact that indeed God has made my adab most excellent because his akhlaq is good because that akhlaq is based on right knowledge or the right places of things. So that in everything he does, he did was because of the knowledge of God in the order of being and existence. So there, adab and akhlaq, they are interrelated. But adab is more inclusive in that sense, yes. Akhlaq is the good activity that we do Good action. Pardon me? It's the result. The result, yes. But adab is the inclusion of the knowledge part of it and then the practical part of it. That's how we understand the, the, the word adab there. That's why he later on, of course, I will, since you cut my, my train of thought, yeah, later on he defined education is really the inculcation of adab in our soul, which means to inculcate the right knowledge, we will produce the right action. In, in that sense. So the, the Sufi tradition which uh, he, he comes from is based on the Ba'alawi tradition. But the Ba'alawi tradition, they say among themselves, that even though their practice of Tasawwuf was much earlier, but later on it became formalized through the intellectual framework of Al-Ghazali, and through the spiritual teachings of Abu Hassan Ashadili, of, of, the, of the 12th, 13th century. So in terms of framing, although it, must, it was based much earlier than, than these two scholars, but the framework was provided by Al-Ghazali and Shadili much later, for example. So, so that's what they say among themselves. Of course, they read also Ibn Arabi, they read Junaid, mainly also. But the, 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 the major framework were, were coming from, from there. Briefly, uh, let me uh, um, state that to Nakibalatas, education is not just ta'lim, because ta'lim is mere instruction, which can which is not complete enough. Because people can be cognitively developed, but morally not developed enough. He also said that, that education in Islamic sense is not even tarbiyah. Although in the Arab world, they call Ministry of Education as Wizarul Tarbiyah wa Ta'alim, the Ministry of Training and Instruction, which means they are still looking for the right comprehensive term for, for education in the Arabic language. So he would say that through comprehensive term for education in the, modern, in the, in the Islam, Islamic Arabic terminology is ta'dib, which is the inculcation of adab in the students. It includes both tarbiyah aspect as well as ta'lim aspect, but also the spiritual aspect. Ta'lim, ta'lim, ain lamim. Uh, and of course, Tarbiyah is from, from Arabic also. Of course, when he went to Sudan with me in 1990s, when Sudan was governed by Hassan Turabi and his group, they invited him to come. We were debating with a group of Tarib committee members, a group of scholars from the, the Middle East, from Iraq, from Tunisia, from Egypt, from Sudan, who were trying to Arabize the uh, terminologies to fit in the educational curriculum. So when they were told that the usage of tarbiyah and ta'alim to me education was rather corrupt, corrupt and not complete, 
But Ta'adib is more complete term. They were laughing. They were saying, well, Ta'adib now, in modern Arabic, is how to hit, how to punish students who are naughty. Yes. And then Nakul Atas laughed. He said, he said, you have limit disciplining only to corporal punishment. Whereas true discipline is more than just corporal punishment. Of course, sometimes you must punish somebody physically. But true discipline involves more than just physical punishment. It is the training of the soul, of the mind. How to think properly and how to behave properly. In fact, even right now, for example, in our family, in our school system, in our classes, you don't have to punish somebody physically. Even by language, they feel more punished than by physical force, isn't it? Even by, by silence, it could be more effective than by words or by uh, physical action. Therefore, when we limit the meaning of a particular term, you corrupt the, the true meaning of that particular term. And Imam Ghazali in his Yaulumudin already showed how certain key terms have been have been reduced in their meanings. And, and, and al Atta saw this in his writing. He saw, for example, how Al-Ghazali demonstrated that by his time, the word fiqih, fiqih was reduced only to jurisprudence. When fiqih, in the Islamic sense, was understanding as a whole. Yes. And by his time, also the word hikmah was reduced only to, to medicine, to tib, for example. And the term elm was reduced to hadith. Therefore, sometimes when you reduce <coughs> major terms to a narrow aspect, you corrupt the term. Right now, for example, jihad, jihad is used only for military exercises. Whereas in the original Islamic sense, jihad is bigger than that. It includes military exercises, but also it includes physical, intellectual, and mental and spiritual exercises also, isn't it? So when you reduce key term like jihad into military, you corrupt the term of jihad. In Ramadan, last couple of months, we were doing, we were all mujahid in that sense, although we were not holding guns or weapons, but we were exercising our spiritual and mental capacity in order to discipline ourselves, isn't it? So, so already the, the, the term adab in this sense also, Dr. Atas notices that adab in the Muslim world has become reduced. It become adabiyat, it become literature. It become, it become manners in the simple sense, social sense. But the disciplining of the soul and the body somehow has been forgotten. Whereas he said that true education is the disciplining of the soul, of the mind, which ultimately includes the discipline of the body, which enables oneself to recognize the places of something correctly in the system, which means in our Islamic worldview, which finally make us realize where Allah fits in this particular order of being in existence. So finally, education is trying to make people into urafa, into people who are aware of God's presence in every state, every condition, and every time. That is a true uh, understanding of what he meant by, by education and ta'dib. It does include ta'lim, naturally, it does include tarbiyah, but it is more than just these two particular concepts. It involves inculcation of other, the spiritual development of men and women as such. Later scholars, the student of say, Abu Hassan Ashadili, by the name of Abu Ambas Al Mursi, the teacher of uh, uh, Ibn Atullah, Ibn Atullah Asikandari, who wrote that very famous book, Kitab al -Hikam. He was talking about adab again, because in a Sufi tradition, adab is so central. And particularly in the tradition of the Ba'lawis. Abu Abbas al-Mursi was saying, was commenting also on the, on, on the teachings of, uh, of Abu Hafs, uh, Umar Salama uh, al-Haddad, that, that Tasawuf is adab in every stage, every moment, every time. He was saying that we have adab in every moment. For example, in the, in the moment when we are performing ibadat, the adab there is that we remember Allah's glory and majesty. In the moment when we are committing sins, even in committing sins, you must have adab. That means you must realize 
that you have committed a sin. Therefore, you must ask for forgiveness and repent and try to be sure of not wanting to repeat those offenses again and try to overcome this commission of sin by doing good things. So, adapt involves not only when you are doing ibadah, but also when you are doing sins. Adapt also involves, as uh, Abul, Abul, Hafs, Abul Abbas was saying, that when you are in the state of suffering, when you suffer, the adapt there is you must have kind opinion of Allah SWT. You must think well of him. Don't ask, for example, why me of all people? I've been praying to you all my life, but why am I getting this punishment? But rather we must think well that despite of all this suffering, there is a wisdom behind that. You are still the determiner of all things as such. So, so, so the Sufis in that sense practice this other in every state. In the state of prayer, in the state of, of, of committing sins, in the state of, 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 of suffering, of getting blessing of God, you must be thankful when you are wealthy or healthy or successful, you must always be thankful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, they practice those things altogether. Let me now go into one step further. How Nakib al apply this Adam to every level again. He said the Adam toward Allah is in having proper aqidah with regard to him. In having proper tawhid with regard to his oneness. A proper understanding with regard to his oneness, not to associate anything with him, either obviously or not obviously. To understand the manifestation of his names and attributes in everything, and to respect all his creatures, good, bad, or otherwise. And Adab to Allah also, as being in the Quran, that even though Allah is the true God, but we are not allowed to condemn the gods of other people. Because if we condemn the gods of other people, they will condemn the true God. Therefore, Adab to Allah requires us not requires to, to, to respect the gods of other people, even though we believe that, that they are not true gods. So already you can see the application of this concept of Adab, as understood by the, the, the disciplining of the mind, body, and soul. Adab for the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is to recognize not only his moral attributes and the fact that he is the last of all the prophets, but to recognize also his metaphysical standing in the order of existence. And the Sufis understand this better than any other group of Muslim scholars, because they look at the prophet based on the Quran and the many sound hadith, that he was the first thing created. And Maulana made a kind, a nice metaphor, and I mentioned that in my poetry, which is published in, in here, inshallah, that when a, when a gardener is planting something, planting a fruit tree, he started from a seed. But all the time, he was thinking of the fruit that will come up at the end of the process of planting the seed, watering the plant, and so forth. So, so was, according to, to Mawlana Rumi, how Allah was planning to create Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Although he came the last of the prophets, the first was Adam, but all the time it was him in the mind, in, 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 in the planning of Allah, in the creation of existence as such. So, Adam to the prophet is not, to look, is not only to look at him as a historical figure, but to look at him also as a metaphysical figure, which make him rather timeless, in that sense. Adam to nature, and that's where uh, early Muslim scholars have not developed. That, but al says that, that we also must have adapted to our nature by not just using it for our own advantages, but looking at God's signs, God's kalima in, in nature. Not to use it only as, as tools for our economic and financial needs, but to respect their proper and rightful places, to use the rivers properly, to use the mountains properly, to look at the plant. Here, unfortunately, no Muslims seem to be having better adapt than us. The Japanese show tremendously good adapt to nature. In fact, sometimes they even worship nature. We are not supposed to worship nature, but we are supposed to look at nature as signs of God's wisdom and mercy and knowledge and power in, in that sense. Yeah. 
adapts to what language is to use words, prefaces, metaphors properly, such so that produce writings that develop human character, that make people closer to Allah Taala through language. That's where adabiyat is supposed to do. But now adabiyat is nothing that produce that makes people closer to Allah SWT. Our, our current literature is, making, is taking people away from, from godliness due to the pressures of commercialism and hedonism and other ism as such. Adapt to ourselves is to recognize the prior importance of nafsul natika as opposed to nafsul hayawaniya that our rational soul must always in total control of the animal soul, so that we all the time behave rationally, intelligently, and properly. And nowadays, this adapt to the self is very much neglected due to the rise of narcissistic philosophy, where people tend to admire their physical self more and more than their moral and spiritual self. I'm just giving you a summarized example of how he developed this concept. Adapt what sounds. Adapt what sounds. Of course, in traditional Ottoman medicine, sounds have been used as a cure also, isn't it? For psycho psychological problems. I went to one of the museums in Izmir somewhere. So adapt what sounds is such that you use sounds in order to produce harmonious music. That makes people be closer to Allah SWT. That makes them people, that makes them courageous in battle. That makes people re re remind of something more profound than themselves. But modern music have lost this adapt to what sounds. So that sounds make them more animalistic. Sounds make them more destructive. Whereas music, which causes this sound, beautiful sound, is supposed to make people more godly more courageous to go to battle, to, to fight in, to, for, for true just causes, and, and so on and so forth. So even to what sounds we must have right adapt. Adapt to what colors. It's such that the right colors are combined properly, such that for nice design and arts. Because that will make your soul tranquil by looking at nice painting, isn't it? Therefore, adapt must be shown to everything, to what sound, to what colors, to what language. And adapt to what Knowledge. Adapt to what knowledge is such that we must make sure that Fadu Ain is only superior to Fadu Kifaya. Right now he noticed that, that this adapt to what knowledge has been inverted. That Fadu Kifaya has been made to, to be more dominant than Fadu Ain. The study of theology, the study of Tasawwuf, the study of Quran Hadith, because they are not economically viable, therefore there is less funding. The best scholars, the best students are not being encouraged, are not even funded to, to, to become scholars of hadith, of philosophy, of history, of theory of Tasawwuf. In many societies, the worst students are forced to go to these areas because they cannot go to medicine, to engineering, to computer science, to informatics. So if, whereas in the, in the past, and Prasad Pasala had made great, great study about this, the ones who went to study Tasawwuf, they went to study theology, and Fuka, and, and Fiki, and Hadith, they were the best students of their time because they should rest proper adapt to what these sciences. Because these sciences were the one that was, stupid, that was supposed to be closer, easier to bring people to the knowledge of God and his teachings. But when the adapt has been lost, Faduqi Fayyaf sciences are made to be more dominant. In fact, they are the one who decide which Faduqi is supposed to be more important. So adapt to knowledge is such that we must put knowledge properly. Knowledge of the soul, knowledge of the of akhlaq and ethics of religion should be made more prior. And the best students and the most intelligent students are supposed to be encouraged to study and to be given the most important support to advance in these studies. But when adapt has been lost, be adapt to our knowledge. Just now, uh, Oja Fendi. Jamal Noor was saying the importance of history. Nakia Latas even go one step further. He was saying that 
for Muslim leaders now, it is for Ain for them to study Islamic history. Because if they don't know properly what Islam has done to world history, they become apologetic, they become defensive, they become ignorant, they become opposition when people want to try to bring religion interest into, into public education. Because Islam for some time has been linked with terrorism, with underdevelopment, with oppression of women, with unscientific activities. Therefore, they don't know what Islam has done to world history. So for these leaders, it's for the eye on them to understand what Islam has done to world history. How it has shaped the world scientifically, morally, intellectually, civilizationally, so that they will not be defensive anymore in order to bring back Islam into public life in a moderate, rational, and proper sense, not in the sense of for the extremists, for example. So it's very interesting. Not only is it important, but it becomes fardu'ain, which means that if you don't do it, you are sinful. Because you will, be, you will not be courageous enough to bring Islam into the forefront of public discourse. Because of your ignorance. Because of your experience with modern Islam, therefore, and since modern Islam is dealing with terrorism, with underdevelopment, with, with oppression, therefore you become afraid to bring back historical relevance of Islam as such. So he said that it's Fadu'ain now. To me, that is a very uh, major ijtihad on his part. This Fadu'ain is not for everybody, but for people who are going to be leaders in every field. In law, economics, politics, sciences, and public life. And adapt towards other communities. Although we as Muslim, we are certain, we believe that we are on the correct path. But we must not oppress others just because they are on a different path. And in Malaysia, after the 13th May accident 1969, in which Muslim and non-Muslim clashed for the first time, hundreds of people died, he wrote a letter to the Minister of Internal, Internal Affairs at that time. He was saying that in this country, we have got all the major religions of the world, Hinduism, Confucianism, Islam, Christianity. Although these religions are different, but we must work together at the ethical, moral level. Because even though at the metaphysical level we may differ, at the theological level we may, we may differ, but there are commonalities at the ethical level. Because every religion wants to bring peace, wants to bring justice, respect scholars, uh, oppose corruption, respect parents and teachers. Therefore, he said, we must use the commonality, the common moral principle of the religion to, to, to unite the people of Malaysia together. Of course, it wasn't accepted because it was too radical for that time. Because they cannot handle the differences in theology and metaphysics with regard to the similarities, some similarities in the ethical moral principle. Other people were trying to force theological similarities when there are no similarities, which is dangerous. Because if we, and according to him, if we try to force artificial similarity at the level of theology, we are doing biadab. We are showing lack of adab to all the prophets and to all religions also. But if we accept differences at the theological level, which are there, but find commonalities at the ethical level, and I think it's supposed to be for the common practical purposes, to love one another, to respect, to oppose corruption, to respect loneliness. That perhaps can be a more practical ground for national unity. So in a modern fragmented world, perhaps these religion-based ethical similarities can be a proper grounding to heal an increasingly fragmented world. But there, adab must be defined in its proper holistic sense. That's why in my, in my studies, I thought that his rediscovery of adab through Sufi tradition, which had been practiced by his forefathers throughout the centuries, can be again a common ground to heal this fragmented world. And in Malaysia, somehow, this thing has been practiced for a long time. Because the Islamization of the Malay world, which includes Malaysia, has been through this kind of Sufi practices. They all were Sharia-minded people, 
But the Sharia minorness were applied and were explained at the level of Tasawwuf, at the level of Ihsan. That's why for those people who have went to, like Dr. Pasala who have been to Indonesia, they, they will see the diversities there. How local cultures were absorbed, but were Islamized. They were no longer Hindu, Buddhist. For example, maybe in Turkish also, Islamization must involve Arab, some form of Arabization. Some basic terms from the Quranic Arabic must be brought into all Muslim languages. But not all of them. So in the Malay world also, some basic pre-Islamic key terms and concepts were retained, but were then given new Islamic meaning. The term that refer to Rab, Rab. Allah was never translated, it was brought in. But Rab, they used Tuhan, which is a pre-Islamic Sanskrit term. Heaven and hell, Shurga and Raka were pre-Islamic Hindus. Dosa, pahala, reward and punishment were pre islamic Hindu terms, but they were given new meanings already. So this, this unity and diversity, this retaining of pre islamic cultures but brought in but with, with new meanings is something what I call dynamic stabilism. Which means that Islamization is dynamic. It, 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 it changes many things, but it retains something more, more basic. As opposed to people who are Stable, the, the conservative, they don't do anything, they don't transform or change, therefore they are stabilizing, but their stability is not progressive. The secular liberals, they are dynamic, they do so much changes, but it destabilizes the core ethical, moral, and spiritual substance of, of Islam. But the true reformers, like the higher Sufis, the higher Fuqaha, the higher Mutakalimun, they were dynamically stabilizing. They make innovation. They made their ijtihad, but their ijtihad and, and reform and innovation well, were stab stabilizing. They brought people together. They did what we call the proper, the, the proper process of Islamization, which made Islam spread to all corners of the world. Ladies and gentlemen, I think I will stop here, and I'll open the floor for comments or questions and answers, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Yes. So, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. May I please ask you to repeat, uh, according to Professor Attas, the term Sufidim, how he describes this, like uh, just pure description. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, from Hodgson's uh, Islamdom, how he uses Sufidim. Yes. Uh, this is my first question. Maybe I will wait for your answer and then ask you the second one. Thank okay. you. Of course, not just Hoxon, but Hoxon, to my mind, because I was reading him rather like, like, like a Bible at Chicago, we are supposed to, to, to read Hoxon. Yeah. So Hoxon made a dichotomy between the Sharia minded scholars who are the Fuqaha mainly, like Abu Anifa, Shafi'i, Ahmad bin Hanbal, yeah, and Utamiya later on, and the, the, the Sufis. Yes. Of course, there are Sufis who don't follow Sharia, which Muslim Sufis attack them as, as people who are, who are extremists. Yeah. But the true Sufis, were always preservers of Sharia. So, Prohalatas later on make it into definition. And I think definition is something which he does very well. Yes. He defined Tasawwuf as a practice of Sharia, at the maqam of Ihsan. You know, there is Islam, Iman Ihsan. Yes. So, Sharia, to, to the Tawai Sufi, is the Sharia practice at that level. Not the level of popular consumption only. Although they all Sufis are Muslim. And all the mu'min, but they also muhsinin, which means they do something not purely for public consumption, although something must be public, to go to Jumat, must be public, to marry, must be public. But they do all these things, it's not for the public. It's for Allah SWT. Sometimes the public will not agree with you, but it doesn't matter, because you're aware of what you are doing. It's based on knowledge, based on your belief. But not because of mere belief, but because of Allah himself, as such. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I would like to ask you to compare the terms Arif and Muhsin conceptually, please. Of course, the, 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 the hadith of Jibreel, yes, when he came and asked about Islam, Iman Ehsan, yes, Muhsin is somebody who internalized or achieved the level of Ehsan. So Ehsan there is you worship 
Allah as if you, you see him. If not, suddenly you recognize that he sees you. Yeah. al Atah says that the second part is higher than the first part. Because to pray as if that you see God, as if there is imp impossibility. As if, which means that it is it's not something possible, not something so easily attainable. But to pray with certainty that he sees you, that is ontologically true all the time. Whether you see him or not, certainly he sees you. Therefore, to recognize that is a stage of higher moral and metaphysical awareness. Isn't it? Yes. Because to think, to, to think you see God is very difficult. But to understand that he sees you all the time, that is higher. Because to, that is constantly all the time. Yes. But Marifa is the, is the more subjective part of it. Meaning that, and Alatas gives a, a comparison there. Knowledge by ilm and knowledge by Marifa. He was saying, for example, that I can know Prasad Pasalan by studying his medical, medical report. By, interviewing, by, by looking into his uh, family background. That I can know him by ilm. But when I know him by Ma'rifah, it's when he himself, after, after knowing me for 30 years, he knows my love of him, he knows my sincerity in his, his friend, my friendship, therefore he whispered to me his secret. He said, Professor Wan, I like durian very much. <laughs> Professor Wan, I cannot eat this medicine. Uh, so so Marifa is that knowledge which Allah himself shares aspect of himself to his to his uh, creators who reach the level of Muslim in that sense. So it it is connected in that sense. Yeah. So so to, to so so Marifa and, and Ehsan are, are two related things. Or the conceptual they are slightly different. Yeah. Because, because Marifah is what God gives. Ihsan is what we also understand. That we understand that reality is, is Allah is observing us all the time. We are never alone in that sense. When we, we, when we reach that level, then he will give a little secret about himself to us. Yes. Wallahu yes. alam. Yes. Thank you very much for a great presentation. And uh, I would like to, uh, I heard from you, Rab and Allah. Yeah. Could you give the little detailed information? What's the differences? Is, is the same things, Rab and Allah, or what's the differences? Of course, yeah, we have got great scholars here who can uh, clarify to you much deeper. But since I'm here in front of you, I've got to be responsible to answer your question. <laughs> um, I heard from you, Yes. Of course, Rab. If in English we call it Lord, Lord, sustainer, owner. This term, although it's in Arabic, but Muslims, when they go, to, when they went to all uh, cultures and civilizations, they translate that into local languages. Like in Persian, they use Khuda, maybe in, in Turkish also. In Malay, they use Tuhan, the pre-Islamic uh, uh, term. But Allah is the name that he himself gives to all the prophets. It's not a human language in that sense. Because to every prophet, because name, name is only known by the name owner. For other, for other, for other beings, it is human beings who name them. And this again is from Nakib latest uh, explanation which Prophet Asalan has been given initial exposition. Yes. But Allah, It's not something that we derive and call him Allah. Inni an Allah Rabbu Alameen, he said to Moses. Indeed, I'm Allah, Lord of the world, in that sense. Therefore, although Allah is being used in Arabic, but it exists also in pre-Islamic Arabic. So Allah is, is, is a name that he himself referred to himself. But Rabb is human beings who call him by that. So that's why in other languages we can use our, our local term, Lord, Rab, Khuda. But in no Islamic languages, the word Allah has been translated. So to say that La ilaha illallah means there is no God but God, that is not a correct translation. There should be there is no God but Allah, that is more correct translation. Because it has, been, it, has, it has not been translated in any Islamic languages before. But briefly, 
Allah refers to the name that he himself used for himself. Rab is a human language to describe who he is, Lord, owner, sustainer, and other descriptions that fit the term Allah, the term, uh, the term Lord in, the, in that sense. Well, Allah, um, yes. Uh, actually, I'm asking, how is the education in your country? Because how do you put adept in your education system? And I mean, uh, in primary schools uh, or in high schools, how do you put it in your system? In the modern national education system, I'm afraid we have not been quite successful because the modern national education system has been derived mostly from Western British education system. But the traditional education system that unifies the Malay world in Russia, Philippines, Southern Thailand has been based on that. That's why even though, for example, we were colonized in Indonesia for 400 years by the Dutch and by the British almost 50 years, and by, by, by the Portuguese and the Dutch before that in, 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 in Malaysia, there was no report of Muslim willingly left their religion. Because even though we lost political battles, we lost our economic battles, but the Akedah, the Akhlaq part were retained because they were taught by proper scholars. But when we became independent, we chose somehow, mistakenly, the British system of education in which religion has not become central. If I is more of Faduki Faya, for instance, mathematics, engineering, medicine, law, whatever it is. Therefore, we know a lot about the world, but we know less and less about ourselves. Therefore, we show a lot of adapt toward the, the world, but not adapt toward the creator of the world and his religion. Yes. So it's difficult. But at the level of institute where he has got a, a role to play from 1987 to 2002, he implemented the adapt very efficiently in the physical sense, that respect toward nature, in a social sense, respect toward Muslim and non-Muslim, toward Muslim different madhab, that he did it, practically speaking. And he did that not as a as a something that is based on learning al alone, but he did that based on his personal understanding and personal lifestyle before. Because this adab is not something that you read and you do. It is, re it is re reflection of your own being already. You cannot practice adab unless you yourself is a man of adab. You, you see what I mean? Therefore, if our politicians are not having right adab, they cannot inculcate adab. It becomes become hypocritical. Therefore, adapt must start with the self first. Then it's easier to do it externally speaking. When, say, the prophet should adapt toward, his, toward the others, it was not something external to him. It was something that is natural to him. Therefore, adapt, that's why the Sufi, the, Sufi, the Sufi method is very important. Because tasawwuf is about transforming yourself first. For the sake of Allah SWT, when you are transformed voluntarily speaking, out of knowledge and love of God. Therefore, it's easier for you to act, to act it outside. But if you do it because of Islam only, therefore you tend to be doing something for political, for social reason. Although that is important, no doubt. But all these reasons must be grounded in, in being aware of his presence all the time. That is not so, not, 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 not so easy. That's why the idea of Marifa and Nathan are two interrelated concepts there. So if you ask about our system of natural education, in a modern secular sense, anywhere is very difficult. Even in America, which, which, which is very strong, they cannot do that. Because the internalization of the discipline is very difficult. That's why they call now in the age of narcissism, narcissism, where people now are begin to respect and love themselves only. And they talk about Donald Trump as the primary example there. Yeah. And, and we, are not, we are not trying to discriminate like America, even America themselves are worried about that. The, 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 therefore, therefore adapt must start from ourselves, our family, our institution, and then he acts life to other than ourselves. Wallahu alam. Yes. Uh, as far as I realized, uh, we cannot compare, of course, uh, uh, as a counterpart. Um, ADAP, uh, in its uh, true 
uh, unreduced meaning uh, with um, civility. Uh, we can say like in the uh, secular form uh, in the Western civilization uh, as we as we counter. Uh, and uh, of course, some of the, some some uh, scholars say that civility is also comes from the um, holy traditions like Christian teachings and others. But most of them now, especially, says that it's an ethical uh, is an ethical. Uh, it, it has ethical foundations from the very very behaviors of the people. So it's a secular term, and uh, it's like most known mechanism is this citizenship. It's how it uh, apply, uh, applied in the uh, community. And when I think about the ADAPT, I, I was thinking, what's the uh, mechanism to, uh, to apply ADAPT uh, amongst not only the Muslims, but the overall community? Maybe we can say like Ummah, like a membership of the Ummah. But since it's, Ummah is now is very questionable, how do you, um, how do you interpret uh, this comparison, or uh, what's your reflection on the uh, mechanism of um, ADAPT in society? Okay. Uh, of course, when you say that uh, is it the same as civility, uh, citizenship, of course it is not the same, but they are overlapping elements. Because if you take ADAPT from the social part, then it involves civility. Because you must also have respect for other people, know their place, and put their pla them in the right place, even though they may not be Muslim, even though they may be Muslim of different motherhood, for example. Yes. Although you may be certain of where you stand and what you are supposed to do, but you must respect their own position there. Yeah. Therefore, that does involve civility, citizenship, but the ground is not just politics and nation state as such. Yeah. So, but well, your question and this question comes everywhere. How do you make practice that? Prof. Nakir Atas is very upset by this question. <laughs> because he would say that you cannot, do, you cannot know how, how to do something unless you know, you know it very well. Therefore, when you know it very well, the how part will come into practice quite easily. You can be creative, you can be innovative, you can, be, you can perform your ijtihad once you know what it is. But if you do not know what it is, then the explanation of how will be very, very mechanical, very rigid and very narrow. That's why to him, adapt is that knowledge first. The recognition of the place of things in our system. That means to, to understand our akidah, our worldview, our sharia, our akhlaq. And then to put that into practice. But if that knowledge is not certain, then you cannot put that into practice. You tend to become too narrow or too rigid and too judgmental because of that. So, so you... I took one one example. Somebody who watch cooking shows. See if you see Johnny, J Jamie Oliver. Jamie Oliver will say that although he's almost he now he closed many of the restaurants now. Yeah. He will say that use a, a pound of pork, a kilogram of pork, and red wine. Of course, from Muslim point of view, you cannot use pork and red wine for cooking. But what you mean that uh, meat with some fat, for example. So when you know what, what does he mean by that, therefore you, 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 you replace pork with duck, with fatty part of the lamb, for example. Yeah. And then red wine, you put fruit juices, apple with some sugar or honey, whatever it is, because the purpose of red wine is fruitiness and sweetness, not wine per se. Although when you boil the wine, it becomes no longer wine. Yeah. But normally we don't do that, for example. So, so when we know something, Ujama, Assalamualaikum. So, so, the first and the most important thing is still knowledge of the thing itself. When we have sufficient knowledge of the thing, then we will know how to put that into practice. If the thing that is needed is not there, you can create improvisation. That's why Islamization everywhere in the world, when it was carried out by scholars of true authority, they became more creative. They were not, they, they were, they were not narrowly imitative in that sense. So when they, went to, when they went to Iran, they did not bring only Arabic language, but they created a new Persian language, which is now called the modern Persian language. When they went to India and Pakistan, there was no, 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 no Pakistan yet, they created Urdu language. It was not purely Arabic, but it is a synthesis of Arabic and, and, and Persian and some local terms and concepts. When they went to the Malay world, they do not use Arabic only, 
but they created a new Malay language, which used some part of the Arabic script, but they were transforming local, local terms and local sounds. They were created because they knew what Islam was. But if they are not understanding Islam sufficiently, they, become, they will equate Islamization with Arabization. Something that is not Arabic is not Islamic. Therefore, you become narrow. In fact, you will kill local cultures. And because of that, many nationalists are afraid of Islamization because they thought that Islamization will be, will be destroying, will be destructive of indigenous cultures. But historically, Islamization not just, not just retained local cultures, but they elevated local culture to higher the, the Persian poetry, which are great poetry. Rumi was right, Maslami was writing in Persian, not in Arabic, for example. Iqbal was writing in Urdu and Persian. And some of the Malay poetry of Sufi type were written in classical Malay language, for example. De therefore, because those who transmitted Islam there, they understand what Islam is. Not just legally, but philosophically, aesthetically, and many other things. So the, the answer to you, how to do it, is to understand the thing first, profoundly. When we understand the thing profoundly, then you know how to put that. Even if the local situation does not give you all the necessary requirement to do that. Because that will demand you to be creative, innovative, and to carry out your ijtihad. Yeah. Very nice to see you. Yeah. Yes. Professor, thank you for your good presentation. I'd like to ask you what I understand, uh, Professor Atas, he thinks adab as holistically. So if he thinks adab as his uh, center, con center, center concept and holistically, uh, I want to know how it could be integrated in social sciences. Uh, is there any uh, experimental work? If it has, what about its result? Does it work in a secular, modern secular society? I think there is, uh, there is Ista or cases. Uh, it was working and cases working now. So what about its output? Is it applicable in a society, in academy, where everything or where uh, much more influenced by secular, secularism or modernism? So thank you. We have got here, in, in, here Professor Niazi Burki, who is a very expert in the development of, of Turkish, nationalism, Turkish secularism. <laughs> the only book I, wrote, I, I read from him is, is that book. <laughs> First, again, the question is how? If you know what Islam is, you know Islamic social science, attitude toward to, to science and social sciences, and you know what secularism, secularization is, you will know how to adapt that. Adapt that, ad, adapt that. Because not all aspects of secular worldview are opposed to Islamic worldview or Islamic sharia or akhlaq. For example, if secularization elevates the rule of reason to seek knowledge and certainty, Islam doesn't oppose that. That's why Muslim scholars in the past, they respect the Greek scholars, because the Greek scholars were taught to be using reason so profoundly. Except that, as Muslim scholars, they also knew the limit of reason. So we will agree with those aspects of secular worldview which seek to alleviate reason to solve some problems, but we know the limit of reason as well. Even Khan would recognize that. Yes. Immanuel Khan, I mean. If secular worldview posit the importance of science to discover the reality of nature and natural world, Islam also demands that. The Quran is full of that. And Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu written a book on that also. Therefore, if you say that, that secular worldview is, is scientific, therefore Islam is, is against that, we, we disagree with that. But if everything must be judged scientifically, then we disagree with that. Because everything can be judged scientifically. Yes. So, so, so what do we mean by secular worldview? That's why Allah Taz, when he talked about secularization, he was talking about secularization as a philosophical program. That, uh, uh, an attempt to remove spiritual meaning from the world of under human understanding. And then, Secularization to him, which is dangerous to Islam, is when no values are regarded as absolute. All values are changing and transitory. That, again, we can accept that. But even in the West, some values are regarded as permanent, the, the, the use of reason, for example. The, 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 the state of the natural world, some are, 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 are profound, profoundly permanent in that sense. Therefore, we cannot just make simple dualism between, say, secular sciences and Islamic sciences. They are very important overlapping elements. Some are profoundly disagreeable with Islam, that we must reject. 
like Al Ghazali rejecting some of the metaphysical ideas of the Greek philosophers, for example. But some are easily adaptable and assimilable in that sense. That's why uh, we, we are stressing again the, the understanding of the Western history and philosophy profoundly in order to find out which aspects are adoptable, which aspects are, uh, are, are to be rejected, and which aspects can be, can, be, can be modified. Islamization in all these three. If right now, like Dr. Ziaudin Sarda and others are saying that Islamization has failed, he is talking about an Islamization that is rooted in political and legal kind of perspective that may be failed. But the metaphysical and the philosophical and the ethical dimension of Islamization, which al has been talking about, to me has not yet been fully understood. Therefore, if it has not been fully understood, it cannot fail yet, isn't it? Yeah. So, so, so our brother, therefore, do not be easily dis dismissive of what people understood by secularization. We must reject some part of it, but there are part of it, they are parallel. They are intersecting elements. So they, not, not just with secular worldviews, but with Hindu worldviews, with Christian worldviews. There are elements which we can, we, can, we can cooperate, we can work together with. That's why he was proposing in Malaysia at least, that the existence of many world religions there can be a basis for moral unity and cooperation. Although at a metaphysical level, there are many basis of, mis basis of differences. Because the Hindus, many of them would, would, would claim to be, to be believing in many gods. Among the Brahmin, they might say, one is of God, but how many are Brahmins, for example? But at the ethical ground, there are much more common ground to work together with. So we, we, we start with that. So, so uh, our argument with the secular will be equal to respect sign, respect reason. When the postmodernists attack, say, enlightenment cause of knowledge, we disagree with that. Because not all aspects of enlightenment cause of knowledge are wrong. The permanency of truth, we can accept that. The, the sound, the universality of reason, we can accept that. But postmodernist ideas framework, they, 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 entirely, they, entirely, they reject entirely the idea of universal truth as such. Because they've seen that in the experience that some of these were, that were thought to be universal were really parochial, nativistic, and politically driven for them. That, that we can, of course, separate. But there are universal aspects of, of, of truth, whether it comes from the West or from, from, from the East. Wallahu alam. How are you? Yes. Thank you for giving me second sense. Uh, you were saying that uh, Nakibul Atas, he emphasizes on Islamic history, study on Islamic history. So what Islamic history he does mean? He means basically Islam as world history. In fact, what Islam has contributed to the world scientifically, morally, culturally, and so forth. Because if the leaders do not know these things, they will not know how to defend the public discussion on Islam. Because for the last several centuries, Islam has been linked entirely with underdevelopment and lately with terrorism, with oppression against women, which are all partly true, but not entirely true. Because there have been Muslims who don't understand Islam, therefore they, they use Islam to justify their erroneous actions. Therefore, if Muslim leaders were to know properly what Islam has done to, to the world history, therefore they will have valid grounds to defend, to justify, and to create new and innovative policies for public, public life. And when I first heard that, I was very surprised. He said, now history in this form is fadu'ain for Muslim leaders. Because many Muslim leaders, although they are ritually Muslim, but when come to public public life, they seem to be behaving and arguing like as if they are not Muslim anymore. And that's dangerous. Not because they don't understand Islam as, as a religion in a ritual sense, but they don't know what Islam has been through all history. 
So he said that, that understanding Islam as holy history is designed for Muslim leaders. Not for everybody, of course. But leaders are in various fields. Yes. Wallahu alam. Professor Ali, maybe I should come here for a longer, longer period of time, maybe for, for one year. Evan, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I want to say two things. Uh, first of all, once more, uh, we have seen that uh, a genius philosopher is able to explain, or we may say describe, a very sophisticated education model only in several words. Uh, may we say, Professor, education is nothing but teaching adapt to someone. And uh, also, Tasawuf, uh, as Professor Van Dawood said, has the same description, you know. He said that Tasawuf is nothing uh, but adep. Then please uh, conclude uh, about that. And uh, the second thing is, once more, uh, well, we know that uh, Sayyid Naqib al-Attas dedicated his life and his works to serve Islam. And now we, we witnessed here uh, one of the most important, you know, masterpiece is your students. I mean, for such an eminent scholar like Sayyid Naqib al Attas. And uh, we witnessed here that Professor Van Dawood uh, has the same spirit and uh, will serve to Islam and will be a kind of bridge, inshallah, among the Muslim communities and uh, the countries. We thank to you very much. And inshallah, we will see you here. Uh, we, we, hope, we hope we will have a future cooperated, inshallah, works in Malaysia maybe, or here, or you said it's uh, one of the middle uh, between Kyoto and uh, Istanbul. Istanbul. Uh, sorry.